Hey guys, welcome to your Saturday edition of Collider Mailbag. I'm Perry, this is Roka, and you're stuck with the two of us all weekend. So we're gonna have some fun. How are you doing, Roka? I'm doing great. I'm holiday excited. Holiday time. Yeah, holiday time. Thank you so much for letting me come on these mailbags this weekend and uh, answer these questions from letting the fans. Letting you, I'm happy to have you. Thank you. We have some good questions today, and the first one comes from Preston, who writes, Hey Collider team, Solo, a Star Wars story is set for release in just five months, but all we've seen is a teaser poster and a few Instagram photos from behind the scenes. Any thoughts on when we'll get the first trailer? Thanks. Roka, what are you predicting on this one? Well, I was thinking Black Panther. It seems to make the most sense coming out February 9th. It's just enough time and space between that and Solo coming out in May, or possibly A Wrinkle in Time. That comes out on March 9th. So those are two films that are getting a lot of buzz, and I think you're going to get the optimal amount of people in the theaters to watch your trailer for the first time for Solo, a Star Wars story. And I guarantee you people are already going to be hyped up to see Black Panther in the theater. So the second it goes Lucasfilm or whatever, that logo pops up, people are going to go in Insane. So most, I think those are my guesses. Most of the time I would do what you just did and I would peg hot Disney movies mm. and say, oh, if it's coming up, that means it's a perfect showcase for a brand new trailer like Han Solo. But I really have a feeling we're going to get it in January. We are oh. just so close. And it feels like the social media presence for the movie has yeah. kind of gone quiet. And for some reason, I'm just leaning towards that meaning they're, they're really, obviously that means they're in post-production, but they're mm -hmm. really working on something. And we're, we also have The Last, like The Last Jedi already came out, but it's gonna be in theaters for a really long time. And wouldn't it be good to pair it up with that at some point? So I have a feeling that it's gonna come before Black Panther. That's interesting. Well, the Cinelinx Cine editor-in-chief, Jordan Mason, said back in October to The Express in the UK that he, from what he had understood, from what he had seen, there was already a trailer that's cut. There's already put back. There's already uh, the marketing stuff is done. When and did the you trailer cut? That from? That's from October 13th. The okay. article, and he said, when they asked him about when they might see the trailer, he said, I have no idea when we'll see it, but one does exist. So there possibly is a cut trailer that's already dancing around. They're just waiting for the right time to drop it. So, just curious, what do you hope is in that cut trailer? Uh, a good movie. <laughs> I mean, I think with, and I think also, I think the reason I think we're gonna wait till February is because this whole Last Jedi, I think, probably caught them all off guard, mm -hmm. and they're playing defense a little bit for the fans' reactions. That they, I'm, I'm sure they expected an overwhelming positive response, and the fact that there's been some backlash to the movie, I think, makes them want to wait till this dies down, and then you can start the solo cycle up again. So maybe wait another month while the film gets a, like a back up and the box office numbers start to increase. Then you can say, okay, people do like mm. the movie, and then they'll release the trailer. Yeah, I wonder if maybe that is on their mind. I yeah. mean, obviously, fan response is something that's important, but yeah. even just the idea of how well The Last Je Jedi performs compared to uh, Force Awakens. Mm in terms of having legs and having minimal week-to-week -week drop. So right. I wonder if maybe they're gauging whether or not it's better off to eventually pair it with that movie or just wait for another release. Sure. So one way or the other, I really hope that this first Han Solo trailer is a lot like the very first Force Awakens trailer mm. where it was just a small handful of shots and they were just stunning shots that meant something and kind of gave you something to chew on without really revealing anything at all. I love that format. So yeah. hopefully that's what's coming our way soon. Mm -hmm. All right, question number two comes from Tom who writes, Hi guys, basic question, but I can't seem to find the answer. Why do studios care about winning Oscars? Surely the reason must be financial, but if a film is no longer showing at the theater, and he, he throws out Get Out and Dunkirk, etc., what do they have to gain from the increased exposure? Thanks. Well, one thing there is some studios do re-release movies around Oscar mm -hmm. season or award season if they think that they could make some more money off of it, which often they do because yeah. there's a lot of people out there who do care about predicting and being able to see everything that could get nominations. So I think financially you could approach it from that angle, but also there's the angle of when something does wind up getting any nominations and then an Oscar nomination, mm -hmm. That is going to drive more people to see it. So even if you're not seeing some of these movies back in theaters now, once the Oscar nominations are announced, they might come back then. And you know, I was just looking at some of the uh, the figures from recent years. In 2017, Hidden Figures, La La Land, and Rival all made over 100 million dollars at the domestic box office. Mm -hmm. 2010, something like The King's Speech, which, st which stands out to me because if The King's Speech wasn't an Oscar-worthy movie. Yeah. 
I wonder if it would have made that much, and it wound up making 135 million domestically. And then also there's the prestige element of it. Mm -hmm. When you're a studio and you could say, hey, our movie is nominated for an Oscar, you look pretty good. Yeah, and also I think you look pretty good to the actors, directors, writers, and producers that you yep. want to attract to your studio. And so that in the long run can bring you more financial success because you can tie these people up to multi-picture contracts and have them be a part of your studio. We don't have the studio system anymore like we had in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, but certainly that is a version of it. Oh, where you know you can, about that, right? Yes, I do. I remember Sorry, those days. Sorry, you left me wide open No, for that no, one. I remember those days, you know, black and white was the way to go. <laughs> but no, those were the, the things that you, you, you see that with the studio. Plus, it also gives the studio some kind of leverage to say in negotiations for you know, how much you're going to compensate these actors, writers, directors, and producers to say like, well, if you come with us, we have a track record of Oscars. And also for the Academy, it lets your studio have even more consideration because you've proven that your films consistently won win Oscars. So they will give your actors, writers, producers, and directors more consideration for their projects mm -hmm. to be nominated over and over and over again. A great example to put all this into perspective for someone is look at A24 right now yeah, because yeah. they have had quite the track record with movies that could have been under the radar maybe not seen by a wider audience. I'm not saying that all of their movies now make a ton of money at the box right. office because that's not the case, but there is no doubt that the fact that that distributor and now production company scooped up so many awards caliber movies mm -hmm. has really skyrocketed it as a company and now yeah. it kind of gives them the leverage to pull in great filmmakers and make more daring projects. I mean, they've always been picking up daring projects, yeah. but just thinking about what they've done recently with you know, It Comes a Night and everything like that. Mm -hmm. I think this year they have The Florida Project, The Disaster Artist, yeah. and I'm forgetting what, oh, Lady Bird is Lady theirs Bird. as well. So yeah. look out for A24 this season. <laughs> All right, question number three comes from Amy Jo, who writes, Hi, Collider Crew. There are only a handful of movies that I can watch over and over, and they are mainly from when I was younger. Top Gun, Tombstone, Dirty Dancing. <laughs> are you a serial watcher of lots of movies, or do you only watch something once or twice because it's not as interesting as watching something? new. Thanks for taking my question and may the Porgs be with you. <laughs> may the Porgs be with you, Amy Cho. I love that outro. Uh, so are you a, a rewatcher oh, yeah. or a one time and done? I'm a massive serial rewatcher <laughs> and that's the reason why I have Netflix, Amazon Prime and Hulu and also all the pay channels for the movies because I like to rewatch movies all the time. To me, it's something I talked about on another show. I said like to movies to me are like the comfort level and a uh, thing that you know and you know Relationships fall apart, friends leave you, things, tragedy happens in your life, things don't go your way, your life's not great, but that movie is always there to bring you comfort and warmth and, remind, and like make you feel happy and smile. And those kinds of things are really important. And so movies have ne movies have let me down, but the great ones have never let me mm -hmm. down on rewatches. And so I like to rewatch them over and over again. And shout out to Top Gun. That is one of my top rewatchable movies. I own it in every possible version, including that weird 3D version they released. So uh, uh, yeah, I watch rewatch re movies all the time. Top one, top one, Top Gun is a big one in yeah. my family. Oh, really? With, with my house. Like, yeah, because my mom loves it. And also, I was talking to her on the phone the other day, yeah. and you know what was playing in the background? Dirty Dancing. <laughs> with, with me, though, it tends to be my favorites of all time that I just mm. watch nonstop. And it's, you know, Jurassic Park, Scream. And I'm not saying that those movies are like warm, loving movies that mm. make all my problems go away and feel better. But right. really, they do make all my problems go away and make me feel better because, one, I enjoy watching them so much. And I find my favorite movies to be just so incredibly immersive where yeah. it's that feeling. And this is why I think rewatching happens, where if you're flipping through the channels and something is on TV and catches your eye, it's just like everything around you just fades away and that's all that exists and you're kind of like transfixed and you can't move Absolutely. or at least I have that problem <laughs> and I do that with other Final Destination I wrote down Billy Madison I watch a lot mm. of Love the Sandlot The Descent and really it's also a cool thing when you could watch a newer release twice mm. because I don't think it's just the element of surprise that's gone and now it's not worth watching that movie again right. because sometimes in a really great movie and the one that comes to mind right now is Get Out you can watch it a second second time knowing how it ends and have a completely mm -hmm. different experience with the uh, material and when that happens I think that's quite the accomplishment. Yeah I have that for Armageddon, for Major League, even The Force Awakens. I love Armageddon. Armageddon is so great and The Force Awakens is one that has become, is one of the most n recent ones that has become eminently yeah. rewatchable in my in my, in my place. Yeah. I'm right there with you. I'm yeah. going to throw out a league of their own too just because I oh, love yeah. that movie Very so much. Very good movie, absolutely. Alright, question number four is from Sammy and he writes, Hey guys, thanks for taking my question. Looking ahead to 2018, if you had to place a bet on the highest box office earner of the year right now, 
what movie would it be? And if you want to make it a little interesting, how about we put something on the line right now? Make this bet real. Good luck. So <laughs> I didn't pick this question because I wanted to crush him at a bet, but I picked it because I love box office right. stuff. So, all right. We've got the big players next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see my notes. I don't need to see your notes. We've got to compare. Yeah. <laughs> well, then. <laughs> Avengers Infinity War. Yes, agreed. Jurassic World Fallen King- yes. Kingdom. Solo, A Star Wars Story. Mm-hmm. The Incredibles. Mm-hmm. Black Panther and Aquaman. I'm not saying that that's the order, but those were the ones I kind of honed in on Mm -hmm. with having just the most potential. And I think there's no denying that Avengers Infinity War will be the winner, even though a lot of these movies will make a lot of money. So when I look at Avengers Infinity War, I go back to Avengers. It opened with $207 million and then went on to take 1.52 1.52 worldwide. Then I look at Age of Ultron and I get 191 million opening weekend and then 1.4 worldwide. Yeah. I think normally with these franchise movies, the numbers tend to dip a little as you go along. Mm-hmm. I think this is going to be an anomaly and it's going to crush an opening weekend, make 215 million opening weekend, mm-hmm. and then I'm putting it at 1.6 worldwide. And I think that that is going to be the top earner of 2018. Interesting. Yeah, I agree with you completely, so we won't lose a bet in that way. I do think Infinity War, it's also uh, a film that, yeah, 1.5, 1.4, and 1.4 for Ultron, and Ultron is not that well received. So if Infinity War blows it, I think Infinity War has a real close to, a real chance of coming close to $2 billion. Mm-hmm. I don't think it'll get there, but I think it has, because it's a stacked summer. So I think it'll come real close, though. But I would put, in order, I would put Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom after him because for some reason people still love okay. that franchise. And then Incredibles 2 at number three because, ah. because it's two things. One, people absolutely love The Incredibles. People love Pixar movies. They're multi-generation movies. And it's a superhero movie. So it just hits all these quadrants at the same time. And I think a lot of people are going to go see this. Families. I think Black Panther under that uh, coming in number four because the buzz for Black Panther is off the charts. I say Solo, a Star Wars story oh, after that. Oh, boy. Okay. I put it that low because I think coming out of Je- Last Jedi, there's some maybe now a little bit of trepidation and also all the backstage st- stuff that's gone on with Solo. And maybe a lot of people weren't, and a lot of people said this, they weren't looking for a Solo Star Wars, a Han Solo movie. So that might affect the box office and Bumblebee will come in there right under Solo Star. I think people are waiting to come back to Transformers movies. And if they show a, a fantastic trailer and this gets reviewed really, really well, people are going to come in so mass to see this movie. What number do you have Bumblebee at right One, now? One, two, three, four, five, six. If Bumblebee, all right, it I'm going to make. Aquaman. I'm going to make. It will beat Aquaman. I'm going to make two bets right now. Yep. If Bumblebee comes at number six or higher, okay, I will buy you lunch at Wood Ranch. So that's that's Done. just like a, a bet I'm going to hand to you. No, no. What do you mean oh, at, by the end of its run, or do you mean when it comes out initially? No, no, no. I mean by the end of its run. Okay, so yeah. I won't see so, that so, until like so this December. this bet is for yeah, yeah. worldwide. Mm-hmm. You know all that stuff. Oh, I do have a really long time. To, <laughs> okay, glad I made that bet. Um, but going by our list, yep. I think the one that we differ on most is probably mm-hmm. Solo. So all right, if we narrow this down okay. to just the top three, I have Avengers Infinity War. I do have Jurassic World mm-hmm. coming in at number two, and then I have Solo, a Star Wars story because. I mean, look at even Rogue One. Rogue yeah. One opened with 155 million for its uh, opening weekend at the domestic box office. Mm-hmm. Went on to take just over one billion right. worldwide. Even though The Incredibles is a highly anticipated sequel from a beloved original, when I break down the numbers for all Pixar movies, mm-hmm. the highest opening goes to Finding Dory with 135. Right. And then its worldwide was only like barely over one billion. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with uh, Toy Story, which is the highest earner worldwide for all Pixar movies. Right. Again, a little more than Finding Dory, but just barely over the one billion dollar mark. Whereas I think Star Wars just has the the stronger track record to suggest that a movie about one of the most iconic characters of mm-hmm. all time is going to get higher than The Incredibles. If Harrison Ford was starring in it, yes, absolutely. But because he isn't, I think that's going to work in its deficit. I say right. $1.2 billion for Incredibles. Oof. I really do think. Hmm? I mean, really, if because that happened, I'd be sad that I lost whatever bet we're making right now. <laughs> but I would be happy for them just because right. you know I love Pixar. Yeah. All right, so most, wait, what's our bet? The most recent example you give, Finding Dory, that's the most recent, yeah. one of the most recent Pixar movies. I don't know what Coco's going to end up at, but like... Finding Dory did really, really well considering it's a sequel. So I think that it still has a good name brand with Pixar. Uh, what's our bet? If, I, if, if you win... If I win, what do I get? And then if you win, what do you get? I will pay for a massage after one of your CrossFit classes. A spa day of a massage. <gasps> there you go. 
Boom. I'll take Nailed that. It. So Nailed do you want a massage in return then? Not no, from no. me, but from another individual? <laughs> no, no. I will take I will take the wood ranch, but I get dessert So you're getting too. wood ranch one way or the other. But oh, I get dessert we're going to add another course. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's yeah. totally fair. I might even buy you a drink with that too Hey-o! if you're lucky. That's All right, so that's, that's the bet. We'll check in with you guys <laughs> at the end of 2018, early 2019. All right, one more question for yes. today. And this one comes from Joe who writes, Hi Collider. A lot of people wanted Ryan Johnson to stay on board for the third installment of the sequel trilogy after J.J. Abrams was announced to be returning. However, after the recent release of The Last Jedi, it seems that many fans are relieved that J.J. is coming back to finish the trilogy after experiencing such a different take with The Last Jedi. Do you think that Ryan should have stayed on for nine, or are you glad that J.J. is coming back to finish what he started? Thanks for taking my question. I'll toss it to you first. Uh, I am still, uh, I am disappointed that Ryan's not coming back for episode nine. I wanted him to come back, and even more so after watching Last Jedi, not in spite of Last Jedi, because I think what Ryan did was absolutely open, blow the doors off the mythology of Star Wars, and I think if you're gonna go this route, you want the guy who blew the doors off to keep going one more film to see, to have him finish out this trilogy. To me, it feels like, hey, I've written this. You, what do you, okay, I'm gonna take that back. So my, one of the uh, funniest memes I've seen since Last Jedi came out was uh, this shot of the crawl, and it says episode nine, J.J. Abrams. It was all a dream. Last Jedi, it was all a dream. Right. And that, that scares the hell out of me. So. What concerns me is you have J.J. coming back, because J.J. laid this groundwork in Force Awakens, and now we have Ryan, who took that groundwork and went in all these different directions. Even Mark Hamill recently has come out in interviews and said, this is not the Luke Skywalker that I was necessarily wanting to do, and this, this is, but this is not my role anymore. It's not my part anymore. It's their Star Wars, and that's a very clear distinction. And so if you're going to go that route, I want you to go, keep going that route, because J.J., in essence, a lot of people said, Force Awakens is a rehash of New Hope, and I think there's valid criticism there. So is he going to do a, a reboot? of Return of the Jedi and take all the sharp edges from Last Jedi and and soften them, which would worry me. Yeah, I think that would disappoint me as well. But I was always someone who was happy to hear that J.J. was Mm. coming back for Nine. It never, it obviously crossed my mind given how positive the early buzz was for The Last Jedi. And also I like Ryan Johnson as a filmmaker in general. So yeah, I guess there there was like a brief moment where I'm like, oh, Ryan's not coming back. But great, J.J., because Mm. I know people's issues with uh, Force Awakens, with it being a carbon copy and all that. And I've said this before, and it's worth repeating. I think he did strike that perfect balance between capturing the the magic of the originals while introducing new things and it just so happens that Ryan Johnson's movie just like took that and freaking Mm -hmm. ran with it Mm -hmm. and I appreciate that approach too I mean really to me those two movies are like the best of both worlds it's reestablishing what was what made this franchise so special to begin with and then it's taking extreme risks and doing something new with a Mm pre-existing franchise so I like both approaches quite a bit but I am happy that JJ is coming back I I do trust him as a filmmaker with this franchise, Mm -hmm. especially given what he did in Force Awakens, and I'm happy that he is the one that's going to kind of wrap it all up, but also given what I saw in The Last Jedi, I think it's really going to suit Ryan Johnson as a filmmaker to, no matter what his trilogy is about, to let him go and kind of start his own thing. I mean, we already know that some of those characters are not coming back. He's going to start with new people, maybe new places, a new tone, I don't know, but giving him that kind of creative creative freedom, I think will suit him well. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, Star Trek Into Darkness uh, didn't do so well, and that was a sequel he directed, and so we'll see, because he really laid the groundwork well, both in Force Awakens and in the reboot of Star Trek, the 2009 reboot. He did a great job mm-hmm. of bringing us all back into these properties and, and reigniting the love for them. Unfortunately, the follow-up with Into Darkness wasn't so well, so hopefully he won't have that same stumbling block walking into uh, episode nine. We'll see. Well. We will see. In a while. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Collider Mailbag. Thank you to everybody who sent in a great question. If you want one of your questions featured on one of our weekend mailbag shows or maybe on Movie Talk, send it on over to collidervideo at gmail.com. Can't stress it enough. Make them interesting, different. You know, when every <laughs> single person asks the Star Wars questions, we can only pick so, we can only right. pick so many. Right. So if you have been sending in repeat questions and they're not being picked, that might be a good tip for you guys. Roka, thank you so much for joining me Thank today. Thank you, Perry. I had a great time. Yep. We will both see you tomorrow for Sunday Mailbag. Have a good afternoon, everyone.